Today, the general social contract is pretty clear. You work to find your way in a society to earn your income so that you can get your own piece of the goods and services that are available in that society. And if you can't work, you have to validate why. You have to have some kind of a disability or, or a specific reason why you should be supported even though you cannot contribute. Uh, a question that our guest today on the Tech Emergence pro podcast, uh, Federico Pistono, brings up is, does that have to be the case? And in a world where more and more of our work is continuously automated, is it best for that to be the case? Federico is an author and a speaker and a social entrepreneur who's done a lot of work in the domain of automation, the impact of automation on society. And we speak today about what if a future society might be like where uh, the same kind of social contract is not involved. Uh, factors involving the minimum, uh, a minimum general minimum wage for everybody in a society, uh, involving what kind of work might be necessary or not necessary, assuming we can get to a certain semblance of automation, and how we might be able to test a different kind of social contract uh, within our society today to figure out maybe what might be a better way to go as more and more of the work around us becomes automated and, and maybe the way we're doing things now is, is no longer the best fit for general human fulfillment and our interactions with each other uh, in our own national economies, never mind globally. So without further ado, we'll delve into this very interesting topic here with Federico. So Federico, I first wanted to get into a deeper dynamic than, than simply job automation uh, and going to some notions that I know you speak and write on around sort of the redefinition of the social construct in an age of these emerging technologies that may replace or augment so many jobs. Talk to us a little bit about how you see the social contract today and, and in your perspective and how it might shift and why. Sure. So up until today, uh, mostly modern society, but uh, also in more primitive society, you had to kind of justify your place within a social structure, within a social organization, whether it was hunter-gatherers or uh, we are subsistence farmers and now modern economies with a more capitalist kind of structure. Um, you perform work in order to receive an income, and with that income you can buy goods and services and things you need to survive. And if you can't work, then you can justify, you have to justify why you can't perform yep. that job, either because you're, you have disabilities or you have other problems. Uh, but in essence, uh, your ability to survive in society needs to have a justification, which is usually labor. Because labor yep. is the way we um, receive an income, and income is the only way we can. Uh, acquire products and, and goods. Yep. Um, that has worked well so far and it has created a lot of the innovation and prosperity that we are experiencing today. And that's to thanks say. to that kind of tied in structure with the capitalist economy and the research for profit at the individual level and that created more complex organization and structures. But with the process of ephemeralization getting to a point where automation is eroding jobs and replacing more and more of the things that we used to do, not just mechanical label, but even more cognitive tasks, you have this paradigm, this dichotomy, where on one side, the market economy wants to automate more because you yep. increase the productivity, prices go down, and you have more revenue per employee, and everything in theory is better, but you lose jobs. Yep. Net. Right. And the, because the, the pace of innovation is speeding up, then you have less and less time to adapt as a society to social change. So in one way, you are pushing for automation while resisting it with unions. Look at what's happening now with the protests on Uber in France. That they are you know, setting um, cars on fire. Yeah, geez. It's just the beginning. It's absolutely <laughs> nothing Indeed. compared to what's coming. I mean, when you fully automate all the process of transportation, you're going to have at least 150 million people out of a job worldwide. And this is a very, very low bound. It's going to be much more than that. So imagine whatever it is now happening in France is going to be a hundredfold, five to ten years from now in most any country. So on, on one side you have that impossibility of reconcile the automation and innovation with the market economy and the ability to have jobs and to perform useful work. And on the other is, well, if you just break the social contract and rediscuss it, suddenly you are welcoming automation instead of resisting it. Because the reason people are resisting automation is because, well, they lose the source of income, which is the ability to perform work. Yep. But if that is not required anymore, then suddenly you want to automate more and more and more because nobody wants to do those shitty jobs. Yeah, well, and I think it's probably safe to say, and it's been mentioned in, on a, 
a number of occasions on this podcast and elsewhere, you know, most people probably don't really like their jobs anyway. Um, well, we actually have data for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Publishes the shift index every year, and it's about eighty percent of the people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, you know, just what, think about. Yeah, well, well, what, what, what we, uh, of course, unemployment, you know, carries the stigma that it does. As we know, unemployment has a pretty significant effect on on well being from from the research as well. But, but, you know, I think, you know, as you had mentioned, you know, a good deal of that may be due to the current construct of the social construct or the social contract and and how that's set up you now feel like you can't contribute you now don't have money to pay rent and things start to crumble around you so uh, what we don't have federico and and i'm interested in sort of maybe what you would think would would uh, be the case here is if let's say and and we'll get into sort of how this might happen as well because i think that'll be very insightful uh, your your kind of prognostications there it is uh um if if people didn't have jobs let's say the you know, uh, X percentage of the folks that have jobs they really don't like. You know, they're, they're making donuts in the morning or they're driving a darn cab around or they're, you know, picking up trash, whatever the case may be. Uh, they no longer have that job and they're able to, to you know, have the bill footed in terms of rent and, and you know, fundamentals of, of food and, and maybe some recreational spending and whatnot. Um, where would, you know, a, a fellow like yourself, right, Federico? I mean, pretty, pretty self-aware guy, lots of projects going on, really kind of, metacognizant about your own values and what you want to do with yourself. What do you think a massive swath of humanity does um, when its time is no longer spent clocking in, clocking out? Will they all start writing poetry, uh, going, you know, becoming good water skiers? You know, what, what, what may happen in that kind of a situation? Well, clearly not everybody will, will, will go into a certain direction because humanity is very different and it's actually a strength of the species, this kind of diversity that we experience uh, sure. throughout the spectrum. And in every culture, you see this immense diversity, even in very homogeneous populations. Um, the, the important thing to understand is that culture creates more culture. So whatever you incentivize, you will get more of that behavior. Um, and cha- social changes don't happen overnight. So if we were to implement, and this is one of the possible ways yep. to kind of break that cycle and change the social contract, a an unconditional basic income or a social dividend or a sort of a redistribution that creates a baseline from which people can create new value, which includes new businesses, services, and so on and so forth. So they can create value on top of a baseline yeah. that we can all agree on. Um, if that happened homogeneously overnight to an entire population, I think that the <laughs> consequences might be very disastrous. So what needs to happen is a transitional period with experiments within cities uh, or within communities where you try out different variations of social new contracts that will, which will be very different from each country and even maybe within regions or within the districts. So we need to take this very, very seriously and, and start a discussion at the level of populations that have at least, let's say, 10,000 people and do trials that will last maybe 18 months or a couple of years, which we, get, we, we can then learn from and expand upon. Huh. And this will create slowly a new kind of culture. Because if I, if I told every Italian, starting tomorrow, or every Greek, starting tomorrow, you're all going to have 1,000 euros a month, you don't have to do anything, I don't think a lot of people will start doing something meaningful because they don't know what to do with their time. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. If you start to create a culture where people can find the time to discover what they're good at, which might not necessarily be something that creates monetary value, but maybe I'll give you a couple of statistics. 48% of Italians at a minimum do voluntary work in associations, freely engaged associations where they clean up the environment, they help the elderly, they help the disabled, they do social activities, completely unpaid work, which does not get accounted into the GDP, but we say that we are in an economic recession. Now, all of this value is created on top of people working two or three days, uh, sorry, two or three jobs yeah, yeah. Uh, just to make the rent. Yep. And, <laughs> and this is all voluntary, and this is just one country. There are many, many countries where... You know, if you look at almost any industrialized nation, between 40 and 60 percent of the population engages in some sort of voluntary social activity that helps the people. Now, um, if that became more part of the culture of the general population, that you are doing something for the community, 
which could be at the global level or even just at your district or the thousand people around you, that already starts to change the mindset. And then you can see, okay, I can do this thing. I can do a workshop on this thing. Or I can help uh, by cleaning up the streets. Or, hey, why don't we start the hackathon to solve this problem? Or all sorts of things just come up and become possible over time if you, if you let people have that experience and experiment. But if you just think that change is going to happen overnight, then, I, you know, uh, of you're course. delusional. Yeah, yeah. Well, it didn't happen that way in, you know, France didn't happen that way in the United States. and didn't, didn't happen that way uh, really anywhere. What, what, what also really didn't ever happen, which I think, you know, you're crossing your fingers for. And, and, and I think in many respects, I'd, I'd be quite interested. And it seems rather fruitful. I, I wouldn't exactly know where to point the finger and, and exactly how to start without doing a lot more homework. But I, I'm congenial with this idea that um, you know, we, we've never we've never experimented with that kind of a social construct at you know a district kind of a level, as you're mentioning, right? I mean, it's an entire nation. Actually, we have huh. actually um, there have been thirteen experiments of basic income in the last uh, thirty-five wow. years. Wow, give give us paint Although some of these pictures. Is... I think these are these are probably less popular than than certainly I thought, and maybe the folks tuned in aren't familiar. Where have these gone down, and how? I'm I'm massively curious. Yeah, so my talk at today has me on this. So there have been 13 experiments, uh, um, actually 27 experiments in 13 countries, but only three of them were could be considered a true basic income or at least, you know, 40 to 60% subsistence level. Okay. Um, and and only two of them had more than a thousand people in the study. So oh. that's why I keep saying that we need more and more of these studies. Y- yeah, yeah. So the two that I that I that I cite that I focus on, those were you know the most uh, comprehensive, but still very small. Yeah. Uh, one was in the province of Manitoba in Canada, um, with uh, thirteen thousand people involved. Oh, six that's and great. Thousand in the in a community, and then the other six and a half thousand in the control group. And they wanted to see if people would work less, for example, or they would stop just doing stuff, or they would spend their money in public bets, such as prostitution, drugs, uh, um, tobacco, gambling, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. As it turns out, it didn't happen. People didn't stop working. They didn't work less. They didn't spend more money on public bets. What it actually happened was hospitalization rate fell by 8.5%. <laughs> totally unexpected result. Why? Well, people had more time to spend with their family with their friends to engage with the community take care of themselves take care of each other and therefore people were less stressed and they needed to you know go to the hospital less because they developed less sicknesses they were like fewer accidents on the streets and all kinds of good things that happen when you kind of create a new social contract as i said before um but this was you know a relatively small study six and a half for thousand sure, people for and sure. same numbers also in india so very well-developed capitalist country with modern economy and rural India is kind of this extreme poverty growing uh, new wave of uh, development yep. and they had very much the same results in completely different circumstances so for example they it was the single most effective way to uh, send little girls to school they've tried everything the government has tried for 40 years to find the incentive structures to send girls to school and nothing ever worked because they could never find the right incentive for people and it turns out that the best incentive is to not create an incentive to just give money and let them self-organize people can get out of debt they have some spare cash um, they understand better they see others doing good things like sending sending girls to schools and they also do that they repair the house uh, they spend money wisely uh, they put for example two um, pipes uh, for plumbing they you know they, they do structural fixes they get out of chronic debt um, they purchase livestock, they increase their yield, they become entrepreneurs. They were three more likely to be entrepreneurs and to start their own business. And they actually worked a lot more with the basic income than without. Rather so curious. completely opposite results to what all of the economists uh, pr- predicted it would happen. They were so skeptical that they didn't, they didn't believe the numbers from the United Nations Development Programming, who was the organization that funded the study. Okay. They sent their own economists there the government of India, and actually they even better than what the United Nations had reported. <laughs> huh, okay. So so we've had a couple of these Petri dishes already. Now, did those uh, did those cease after, was, was this a kind of 18-month stint, as you had mentioned beforehand, or how long were these experiments? 
So the one in Canada, I believe it was three years, and the one in India was for 18 months. Got it. Uh, but the one in India, because it was so successful, it sparked a huge interest, and now the government is doing hundreds of these pilots throughout the country. Ah, oh, curious. Turns out okay, that it was so this the is the most effective wow. way for the the government to relieve poverty. And and now the, in Canada. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. In Canada, it was the exact opposite. Huh. The results were the opposite of what economists predicted because they kind of wanted to prove that just giving free money was a bad idea. Yep. But it didn't happen, and so what they did, they tried to ostracize the results. And the university uh, researchers who tried to publish, they were bullied into not publishing results or faking the results for many, many years. And so the truth only came out like 20 years later. Whoa, so wait, when was this experiment done? It was in 1973, I believe. You've got to be kidding me. Wow, in, in, in incredible. I, I suppose the notion of basic income, maybe without the verbiage that we're now familiar, um, was maybe to some degree... Uh, you know, it doesn't surprise me at all that it had been articulated beforehand, but it does surprise me that they would run a social experiment at that scale that long ago. So in, in Canada, it doesn't sound like is running another one anytime soon, or are they like India sort of seriously considering getting a few more of these going on to get some more experimental information back here? So for more than 30 years, all the Western world kind of silenced these uh, results, and they tried to hide everything because they were too afraid that you know, they would actually pick up stream and change the establishment. Uh, who who so is afraid? Who's now? afraid in your perspective, Federico? I mean, I'm curious, you know, is this, who, who gets, you know, it sounds as though, I mean, you know, we could say, you know, uh, we could say it's the worst idea ever. We could say it's ubiquitously panacea and everything's better. Both of those, of course, would be completely ignorant. Um, there's going to be pros. There's going to be cons. Who, who is so afraid of the cons and and who may in fact sort of if anybody's hurt who who would be quote unquote hurt with this kind of a change in the social dynamic is this the very wealthy and powerful who would have you know kind of their 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 wealth sort of sloughed off uh towards this general disbursement um who's who's duking it out and keeping this stuff under wraps in your perspective so i think that who would be worse off the answer is nobody because even very wealthy people who are smart enough to understand it for example Three weeks ago, um, uh, Michael Rupert, uh, no, uh, Michelle um, Rupert, uh, okay. you, I'm going to have to check the name because I'm having a... a it's all right, it's all right. Are you referring to uh, Rupert? Are we talking to, about the media mogul there? Is this the Rupert so that I think is, we're talking about? He, he is this, he's the CEO of Richmond, one of the largest uh, companies that deals with the luxury goods okay, got it, in got the it. world. So I think his, his name is Michael Rupert, but he... Um, he was speaking at the Financial Times Industry Luxury Summit 2015, and uh, he said that what keeps him awake at night, uh, so because they were all talking about e-commerce and kind of how that was eroding their business, yeah. and, and all of that, and was like, you guys are insane, what are you talking about? Like, you are discussing about a $10,000 watch, uh, gold watch from Apple, uh, while there is social unrest coming. I mean, there is going to be social warfare uh, and this is what keeps me awake at night the, the new wave of automation with an unequal distribution of resources and wealth is just going to keep increasing and the social stigma that will be created from the people just imagine I, w I will not you know buy um, luxury goods or you know very showy stuff to my children when my children's classmates parents get laid off by some technology or they have to help finance. So I'm not going to have anything showy. So what are you guys talking about? Oh, Social warfare uh, is coming. And you're I'm talking curious. about a $10,000 watch? You guys are stupid. And then he said, you don't believe me? Go read this book. And then he says, my book. And I was like, what? <laughs> That's good. So, so he, so he, um, He's at now. He's in the luxury goods domain. So I suppose that's why he's biting his nails. Because he sees the bite back sort of in that sector. So, so it's clearly there is that aspect, but there is also the recognition that the social fabric, if you destroy the middle class, there is no more social fabric that supports everything, and then it, society just collapses and crumbles. So there is a double recognition. One is for the survival of his business, and the other is for this, just the survival in society in general. Got it. So, okay, okay. So, so you're of the belief so, that 
the the people who are fighting it really shouldn't be. And no matter how wealthy you are, you and the world would be better should we slice and dice the, the dollars. Because a strong middle class always leads to a better society. And we have, have historical proof of this over and over in every century, every respect, in every society that we have experimented on and we have solid data. Strong middle class leads to better life for everyone, including the wealthy. Got um, it. What is clear then on the other side is those who are fighting it are those who don't understand this. Those who are afraid of change because they are comfortable in the position where they are now. And so they think that any change might lead maybe to a better situation, but maybe to a worse situation. Uh, yeah, so yeah. definitely they don't want change <laughs> unless they're sure that it's going to be better. Yeah, yeah. So if it's a, <laughs> exactly. So you have something to lose, right? So the, the wealthy... You know the, the the wealthy. I mean, it's it's interesting. The word conservative and the word progressive themselves, with their connotations. When you have something to lose, aren't you a smidge more likely to be? Because you know, isn't radical social change a little bit more dangerous? You know, when you're in your van, you know, with uh, your guitar, you know, I mean, whatever will come will come to some degree. And so, so it seems as though, uh, unless there was real certainty, a lot of folks in in certain positions wouldn't wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't really want that transition to carry forward. Uh, Federico, because I'm, I'm wary of, of our time, um, but, but I know that we'll have folks in the audience who are fascinated by this uh, dynamic, it seems as though for you there is sort of a, a, a wave in this regard in terms of the redefinition of the social contract and how automation ought fit in. And, and to be frank, I, I mean, although I have not done my homework on the domain enough to feel as strongly as you do in, on a particular camp, what I will say is that it seems difficult to question the fact that this is a very relevant conversation today before kind of the blank hits the fan uh, with respect to automation and whatnot. I think it's a more than worthwhile conversation. Obviously, people can find you at federicopistono.com. Com, which I'll make sure that I link up to in, in the interview itself. Federico, if somebody wants to do their own homework um, and, and figure out where this research is coming from, learn from other people that are talking about how this redefinition might happen, who do you like and respect and where might be some good places for folks to, to sort of dive into this, this uh, conversation? Yeah, so it's interesting because there is not a lot of uh, material out there. That's a shame. Um, there are, yeah, so there, there are some people that are doing good work um, uh, for example, um, Scott, who writes at Medium, uh, I, I kind of forgot his surname now, but I can put the link uh, somewhere. Yeah, cool, cool, yeah, um, if you get, maybe, yep, that's fine. Yeah, maybe we're going to do something together and collaborate. And so what I'm doing now with my course on Conos called Robots Will Steal Your Job is to um, aggregate the good resources that are on this topic and kind of give an overview of who is doing good research and where the discussion is going. And it's actually a growing project because every week I'll be adding new videos, both that I create and videos that others have created and put them all into a course. And I'm kind of curating this new path that you can follow to discover about this new social change. Yeah, I, I, so I like it. To, yep, go ahead. Yeah, so you go and you search for robots who steal your job, you'll find that course. And in there, every week you get notifications of new things that will be added. And I will be both putting my personal perspective as well as everyone else's great point of view and research that plugs into this discussion. Big time. And, and, and that's, uh, that's something that I think it's, it's, uh, it's hard to argue with, proliferating a worthwhile conversation about these dynamics. I mean, there's, uh, there's nothing but upside to, to a well-done version of that. So Federico, uh, glad that you were able to be here and share some of your per perspectives today on the Tech Emergence podcast. And thanks for being here. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, good research and learning to all of the audience. Indeed. And that wraps up this episode on the Tech Emergence Podcast. Thanks for being here, and remember to subscribe on iTunes to stay on top of the latest news breaks, researcher perspectives, and entrepreneur interviews in artificial intelligence, neurotechnology, and more. And we want to hear from you as well. So be sure to leave a review on iTunes, which are always appreciated, or contact us directly at info at techemergence.com. And remember, all of our entrepreneur interviews and interviews with top researchers from around the world, from Stanford to Oxford and beyond, can be found right on our main site at techemergence.com. Remember to sign up for the newsletter while you're there. So with the best of intentions for a brilliant future, this is Dan Figella signing off.
and I'll see you next week.